Hello everyone, and welcome to video number two, in which I'll be introducing a few key concepts when it comes to macroevolution, as well as defining the term, and finishing with an explanation of a thing called the molecular clock. I suppose this is also a concept, but it's quite an important one, so I thought I would include it in this title. But before we start talking more about macroevolution, uh, we first have to ask ourselves, what is macroevolution? Well, I would say in general, we can identify that evolution is studied from two different perspectives. There is a whole host of people, of researchers, often biologists and ecologists, for example, that look at the processes that lead to evolutionary change and reproductive isolation within and among populations. Then in contrast to that, there are those researchers, often paleontologists, that study the long-term fate of species or higher ranked taxa throughout geological time. So a key question if we're wondering what is macroevolution is, is this just an aspect of how we tend to study the process due to differing forms of evidence? Or are there actually meaningful differences between evolution on a very small scale and evolution on a, on a larger scale? So I guess more correctly, rather than what is macro, macro evolution, we may more say what just is macroevolution. Is macroevolution any way different from any of the small changes that we see on a smaller scale? Well, exact definitions of macroevolution differ, both as they were conceived and have been viewed historically and, <clears throat> and how we consider them now. Indeed, there's a paper on this that I've, I've put as a reference on the bottom of this slide here for you that looks at this very, very recently, actually. It came out this year. And this argues, this paper, that there were three major definitions. One, macroevolution is the evolution of taxa above the rank of species. Two, that evolution, macroevolution is the evolution of life on a grand scale. Three, that evolution is guided by sorting of interspecific variation as opposed to the sorting of intraspecific variation in microevolution. So I put some definitions of those terms just above this video for you. So if we think about those definitions, certainly um, this paper makes, I think, a strong case that in number one, we can't really identify any meaningful differences between the evolution of species and higher rat taxa. Right, so um, a species, um, so say looking at the difference between a, a family and an order is not particularly meaningful or useful to us. Um, and certainly if we also look at number two, that's very vague, right, a grand time scale. So this paper makes the case that the only defini definition of microevolution that is meaningful and allows for a consistent separation of macro and microevolution is number three. So this is where speciation separates macroevolution from microevolution. And you covered speciation with Rob uh, previously, so you know the species concept is not perfect, but it's useful. So within that definition and that concept, macroevolution occurs through differences in speciation and extinction rates. Okay? So that is a, a working hypothesis that allows us to define macroevolution, but the question is, is that useful? As Rob has highlighted, um, evolution on a large scale can uh, be viewed as the accumulation of those smaller changes. But a definition would be useful if the impacts of concepts and processes such as fitness, competition, and selection differ between the micro and the macro evolutionary level. And this paper makes a case that this is true and thus that microevolution is a useful concept. So it suggests that microevolution is the sorting of inter rather than intraspecific variation. And it illustrates this with the example on the left. Imagine a um, prey species A, which has this range of potential maximum speeds, and a prey species B, which has a different range of potential maximum speeds. If you have a predator then with a speed that is shown by position one here, some of the individuals in prey species A are able to outrun this predator. That makes sense, right? This predator is faster than most of prey species A, 
this shows frequency, but is slower than some of the other ones. That will then elicit a micro evolutionary response in prey species A. Some of them can escape. In position two, that is not true. No members of species A can escape from predator with a predator with the top speed in position two. However, if you think about this between species, um, this is not the case. In, in the position two here, prey species B has a selective advantage over prey species A. There's a difference between those two species and it's in th this difference that we can expect um, to find macroevolution, this kind of idea of sorting interspecific rather than intraspecific variation. We can also break that down into two kind of different um, regimes, if we so wish. And we can say that microevolution, uh, based on this definition, occurs within species, um, and it occurs via intraspecific competition. This can either result in anagenetic change. This is change within a single lineage. So it's just like, the, say, the change of shape of a shell through time without any given speciation event. Or it can result in a thing called cladogenic change. So this is cladogenesis. This is um, the budding of one lineage into two. This is a speciation event. And then that leads to between species variation and thus clade evolution. So the key difference here is this intra versus interspecific variation. I will leave it up to you to decide whether you think it's a useful definition or not. But that is where we currently stand on this topic. So I had to pick really carefully uh, what concepts I wanted to feature in this lecture because there are so many that I could talk about that are really cool within microevolution, a whole host of possibilities. And I've chosen the Red Queen hypothesis because I think it's a really interesting one. We met this before when we were talking about the maintenance of sex. It has its origins in Alice Through the Looking Glass, this really cool quote that I put on this um, slide here, um, where the Red Queen says, in this part of the world, you have to um, do all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run twice as fast as that. So the Red Queen was, is an idea that was originally developed in paleontology in the 1970s. Over the years, it has come though to encompass numerous evolutionary theories that kind of champion biotic interactions as significant mechanisms for evolutionary change. There is a lot of baggage um, and if you're interested in that baggage and kind of like all of the different areas it's been um, applied to, this paper here from 2018 that I'm basing much of this slide on is actually a really good introduction that then goes on to redefine the Red Queen in kind of like a, a, a kind of constrained way that we can actually use within science. And I think that's, that's really um, a really good example of, um, of how we can view this in a useful way. So I've used this image in the middle to try and demonstrate kind of the difference between the red queen and the alternative suggestion. And this, um, these graphs show uh, an important trait that matters to predators and prey, such as speed, such as the idea we met in the last video. At the top, you can see that there is a blue species here that's going extinct. And it's doing so because this green species here, um, which is its prey, is actually, um, evolving faster speeds, in this example of this speed, to move out of the adaptive zone of this blue species. This biotic interaction, this evolution of the green species has taken it to a point where it can outrun its predator and that predator has died off. It doesn't necessarily mean it's safe, so we've got a black line here representing another predator that may be able to eat this particular prey species. But nevertheless, the extinction of this species in this instance was brought about by the evolution of another group. So that right there is the Red Queen. In the bottom here, you can see the same kind of dynamic that we may see in the fossil record, say, but at the same time, this blue species is going extinct because there's an abiotic factor that's driving it to extinction, such as this, say that's temperature, a, a reduction in temperatures may result in the extinction of this blue species here. It's not due to the interactions with its prey species. That's an idea that's known as the court jester. So you have the red queen on one hand and you have the court jester on the other. On the right, 
I've put the um, reformulation of the Red Queen from this paper because I thought it was quite interesting and it was quite useful. Um, and I wanted to highlight just a few aspects of this re redefinition. So here you can see in the very top, we have two interacting co-evolving species, species A and species B, that look to have a relatively fixed um, relative fitness over time. So they're not like massively out competing each other. They just seem to be uh, relatively unchanged when we look at them at a broad scale, say in the fossil record. But these changes in mean fitness may well be, um, sorry, we may well, if we zoom in, see changes in mean fitness at a finer scale. So that's this box here. So we, we may, for example, see species A and species B interacting, and they could be um, um, some kind of relationship between them where when species B is successful, say it's a predator, species A is less successful, that leads to less success in species B. And so those two are actually, whilst they appear to be unchanging at a big scale, are actually in some kind of equilibrium, but an equilibrium of constant change. And those changes in mean fitness that we see within these different species may actually relate to things that are happening at an even smaller scale in populations. And these could be the populations re responding to each other to biotic factors, for example, or responding to abiotic forcing. So even though the mean relative fitness of these two species may appear constant over time, we can say that actually evolution is occurring. And then we may expect that significant abiotic events could alter the balance that we would otherwise see as a lack of change in the fossil record. And so we may expect individual populations of either species to become isolated, to form new species, for example, or to become extinct. So it's kind of like this constantly changing um, idea of, of interactions between species, um, and because it's the Red Queen, it's focusing on that, but with the possibility of overprinting from um, major biotic factors forcing these. So it's worth noting that an implication of that last example is that these hypotheses, the, the Red Queen and the court jester, have different evolutionary and spatial scales. It's an idea that's actually been around for a while, and the, the paper that I've cited here provides an overview of that from the world of paleontology. Um, it suggests that competition, predation, and other biotic factors shape ecosystems locally and over short time spans, as shown on this part of the, the graph on the right-hand side here. So our red queen is actually over these small spatial and time scales. We might then expect extrinsic factors such as climate and oceanographic change and tectonic events to shape larger scale patterns, both regionally and globally, over thousands to millions of years. So you've got this division between the Red Queen and the Court Jet Jester based on scale. And I think for our purposes, this is a useful way to consider the Red Queen as we think about both time scales, um, kind of when looking at the fossil record. So I want to finish this particular video by highlighting that many interesting questions in evolution surround the idea of the rates at which evolution proceeds. So this is basically just context for the things about rates that comes later, and it involves some fairly, I guess, um, challenging concepts. So I will do my best to explain them briefly, so as not to talk for too long. But if you want a, a, a kind of longer explanation, I'll both provide you with some um, reading that will hopefully um, present them to you in a more understandable manner. And of course, you can ask me questions in the Zoom session. But I wanted to, um, the detail that I wanted to add is an idea of a thing called the molecular clock. And the principle behind this is really simple. So if we're looking at a molecular phylogeny, so we're looking at the DNA of species, and we've got a common ancestor of um, two species um, at, say, 50 million years ago, and they've got this DNA here. If, and this is an assumption, bear that in mind, if their DNA, um, because we've recognized, we've, we've already said that DNA is kind of, it mutates in a stochastic way, it's quite random, we may expect that to happen at a fairly um, consistent rate, right? So we may expect that if you have a common ancestor here, after 25 million years, the, we may look at the DNA of these species and we may find out they are one nucleotide base pair apart. Right, so you've got two differences after 25 million years. If that's the case, you would then expect four differences after 50 million years. If you then get a fossil of this common ancestor and you use that to constrain 
this point in your tree, this is the node of a tree, that's the point at which speciation occurs, you can calibrate that rate of change. Yeah. Then if you are looking at a broader tree, so you're looking at an individual that splits off earlier from this lineage than either of these two, you can assess the number of changes in its DNA. Um, you can use the calibration to get the rate of change and the difference between this one and those two to estimate how long ago that divergence happened based on the number of nucleotide base pair changes that it's got. That makes sense? I think that's a fairly, um, it's, a, it's a really cool idea. It's the idea of the molecular clock that you can use this um, evolution of um, the DNA to, to understand through calibration with fossils, um, some of the evolutionary dynamics of this in deep time. And that can either be divergence times, but it can also allow us to look at, if you've got lots of fossils in there to calibrate your tree, where you get short internodes. So these are kind of like short branches on a tree. And these are areas where, if, for example, you have the morphology of your fossils included, you may then be able to map the morphology to those branches and spot periods of elevated evolution. So your branch lengths are based on the changes that you model in your DNA. Um, and the morphology is then carried along with this. But in the latest techniques, as I'll be covering in the next uh, video, we can actually do this for morphology as well now by modeling the way the morphology evolves. And so what this allows us to say is that using those probabilistic approaches that Rob introduced, so these are the ones that aren't parsimony, that you actually model evolution, what we can do is we can actually conduct this um, kind of process. We can calibrate um, the rate of change of both the morphology and the molecules using fossils, if we so wish, and we can use that with the probabilistic approach, the model of evolution, to work out our most probable tree, including the lengths of the branches, and that can tell us about evolutionary rates. But I think that's a really um, key point to take home from this, is that nowadays we can use these exciting um, new approaches to deriving phylogenies to understand not only evolutionary relationships, but the rate at which evolution happened. I have a, uh, another slide that I can use to explain how these clocks work in the Zoom session if you would like to know how they work. If you are in that position, you're watching this video before the Zoom session, please send me an email and I will include it. But with that, I will see you in video number three. Yeah.